morning. It's so good to see you. I was hoping you would stop by the channel this morning. My name's Ron Schultz. I'm the interim minister at Union, the church at Chelsea Park. We're a United Methodist congregation serving God through that church in the community and around the world. And we're glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. The scripture comes from John's gospel, chapter 15, beginning the reading with verse 9. And this morning I'm reading from the message translation. I've loved you the way my father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done, kept my father's commands and made myself at home in his love. I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy and your joy wholly mature. This is my command, love one another the way I loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things I command you. I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. You didn't choose me. Remember, I chose you and put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bearers, whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, he gives you. But remember the root command, love one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, I think you'd probably agree this is a passage that has a lot of depth to it. Obviously, in, in the story, we're in the middle of the room with Jesus, that upper room where he's sharing that last meal with his disciples. We're in that place where we hear Jesus say as he breaks the bread, this is my body broken for you. We hear him say as he lifts up the cup of wine, this is my blood poured out for you and for the world for the forgiveness of sins. Take and eat and drink and be thankful. That's also the room where Jesus took on the role of a servant. He knelt down and washed each disciple's feet. It's the place where we heard him say that one of you will betray me. It's the place where we hear Jesus say, love one another. As I have loved you, I command you to love one another. It's the place where he says, one of you will deny me. It's the place where he claims to be the way, the truth. In the life. This is the room where Jesus gives the promise of the Holy Spirit who will come to be a comforter. This is the room where Jesus talks about being the vine and us being the branches. Jesus says very clearly in this room, love each other just as I have loved you. I'm not calling you servants any longer, he says. I'm calling you friends because I'm telling you everything I heard from the Father. Wow. We've moved from being a servant to being a friend. That's, that's quite a promotion if you think about it. Now, it's not like a, a Facebook friend request, you know, if you're on Facebook, you, you look and you see somebody's requesting your friendship. And so you look over on their page and learn a little bit about them. And if you want to, then you accept their request to be a friend. It's not like that. Jesus is not, not doing it that way. Jesus chooses us. 
Jesus friends us. Jesus says, I'm not going to call you servants any longer. I'm going to call you friends because I've shared with you everything the Father has told me. You might recall that Abraham was referred to as a friend of God. Genesis chapter 18 goes to great lengths to describe that friend relationship between Abraham and God. Abraham is such a friend to God that Abraham is walking with God and God decides to tell Abraham what's about to happen to Sodom. And as God describes all that's about to occur in Sodom, Abraham says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're not going to destroy that place if there are 50 people who are righteous, are you? You're not going to destroy the righteous along with the sinful? Surely not. And God says, no, no, no. I, if there are 50 there, I won't destroy the place. And then Abraham says, well, what if there are 45 or 40 or 30 or 20? Or 10. Abraham was described as a friend of God and in a bargaining with God. James chapter 2 and 2 Chronicles chapter 2 all remind us that Abraham was called God's friend. But you'll also remember that Abraham was was old and Abraham was retired and Abraham was settled in in Ur of the Chaldeans and God's voice came to Abraham and called him to leave his father's land. And Abraham left and took his wife Sarai with him and they became homeless. They were wanderers. Abraham had the promise of God to be the father of nations, but they wandered to and fro without a place to call their own home as they looked for the promised land that God had promised to give them. Abram and his wife Sarah just found themselves in a place where they just couldn't wait any longer, so they hatched this plan to to help God along with God's promise. And they created a child. And they named that child Ishmael. And it was only later that God's promise was fulfilled in the birth of the long-awaited child who was named Isaac. It was that boy, Isaac, that God called on Abraham and said, I want you to give up Isaac. I want you to sacrifice Isaac. Abraham is a friend of God, remember. Abraham has finally got the son he's longed for, and now Abraham's friend, God, is asking for Isaac to be sacrificed. Sarah finally dies. Abraham eventually remarries. He has more children. He has grandchildren. Abraham himself ultimately dies, and he is buried in a land that does not belong to him. I'll just tell you, it's a, it looks like it's a tough life for someone who is called friend of God. I remember the story of a woman named St. Teresa of Avila. She was a Catholic nun. When she was seven years old, she suffered the trauma of her mother's death. And her life was filled with all sorts of illnesses, epilepsy. She was remembered by the church as a friend of God. She spent much of her life as a nun wandering the streets, begging in public to raise money to build an orphanage. 
And once the orphanage was built, she saw that orphanage destroyed by flood. So she begged for more money to rebuild it, only to see the orphanage destroyed again by a terrible storm. And she walked the streets begging for more money to rebuild it, only to see that orphanage burned to the ground in a fire. Over and over and over, she begged, she built, she begged, she rebuilt. In her journals, you could read for yourself, during one of her evening prayers, St. Teresa of Avalov says to God in prayer, so this is how you treat your friends? No wonder you have so few. Jesus says, I'm not going to refer to you as servants any longer. I'm going to call you friends. That can sound like a promotion. Jesus has demonstrated what servanthood looks like. He's washed the feet of the disciples. He has said to the disciples, wash each other's feet. Servants are not greater than their master. And then Jesus changes the title from servants to friends. Just like that, those who sacrifice to follow and to serve are now called friends. Surely that's a promotion. Everybody knows that. Two people are sitting in a restaurant. They're overheard while they're talking. One of them says, things are just so expensive now. Gas is, is out of sight. Building materials cost so much. We've wanted to go to the beach but we can't find anything to rent for less than $1,000 for a week. We can't afford that. And the other person seated at the table says, I know exactly what you mean, and I'm sorry you're going through that. The only way we get to go to the beach this year is because we have this friend who owns a place. My friend gave me tickets to the golf tournament. My friend gave me front row seats at the concert. My friend gave me 50 yard line tickets to go to the football game. You see the benefit of having a friend? Jesus has called us friends. Think about it. No more talk of dragging a cross just hearing his voice say, come friend, walk with me and let's walk together. Sure sounds like a promotion to have a friend in a high position like Jesus. It could even be called an overwhelming gift, couldn't it? I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. Now that's the truth. God said it, I believe it. God's in control, I'm not in control, I'm not God. I just do what I'm told, I'm a servant, I just do what the Bible says. That's pretty comfortable and convenient if you think about it. Because the Bible says, right here in John 15, that Jesus is calling us friends. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. In other words, a friend of Jesus shares in the knowledge of God's operation in the world. A friend shares the weight and the responsibility of what God is doing and how God is doing it. You can call a lot of people and you can say to those people, hey, I'm, I'm calling because I wanted you to know I'm changing things up over here and, and, well, I just need your help. Only a friend will say, sure, 
I'll be glad to come and help you load those boxes and move those boxes. Oh, you got a piano and a pool table? Yeah, I'll help you move that too because, you know, we're friends. Only a friend's going to say that. God is creating a world of love that is to embrace everyone. And God is calling friends to help. You see, being a friend has a price tag. Being a friend costs something. Knowing what Jesus heard from God, the friend shares in the burdensome responsibility of that knowledge. The servant does not know what the master is doing. But that has its bright side, doesn't it? The servant doesn't take their work home with them. The servant just puts in their day's work and go home and forget about it until the next day. Sometimes, while the servant is at home resting, the master is up all night, pacing back and forth, worrying, working, trying to work everything out. The servant's at home resting. The daily job is done. The servant is clocked out but the master is still burning the midnight oil because there's more work to be done. If a servant becomes a friend, then the master's burdens become the friend's burdens. Isn't that true? It seems that friends of Jesus are never completely free of the duty to bear the fruit and pay the price of love. Do you really want to be Jesus' friend? Do you really want to know everything Jesus heard from the Father? I'll be the first to confess that there's some comfort in deliberate ignorance. I don't want to see pictures of starving, abused dogs and cats while I'm trying to watch TV. I don't want to know about that. I don't want to know the number and names of hungry children in this county. I, I don't want to know about people who ruin their lives with drugs. I, I don't want to know about people's marriage problems. I don't want to know that Another child has been shot. There's, there's a lot of information. I just prefer not to know. But to be a friend of Jesus is to be told these uncomfortable truths. To be a friend of Jesus is to know these truths that carry unavoidable duty. The duty to get involved, the duty to love other people as Jesus has loved us, to love as God loves, to lay down one's own life, to set aside what I want for what God wants. Years ago, I was coming out of the church that I was serving and I was headed to my car and I saw a guy walking down the street and he was obviously homeless. And when he saw me, he started walking toward me and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm in a hurry. I, I don't really want to take time with this guy. I just, I just want to get in my car and go do the things I'm supposed to be doing. And, and, and I don't want to be bothered by him. So as soon as he got up to me, he said, are you the preacher? And I was already reaching in my pocket. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm the preacher. And he said, well, I'm hoping you can help me. I'm trying to get uh, farther down the road. And, and without listening to the rest of his story, I just pulled out the money in my pocket. And I said, here, here's $7. It's all I've got on me. Good luck. He took the money. And he turned to walk away and then he stopped and he turned and he looked back and he said, if you're waiting on me to say thank you, forget it. And I said, what? <laughs> he, 
He said, I'm not going to say thank you because you're a Christian and you don't help me because you really want to. You have to help me because he told you to help me. <laughs> Can you believe the nerve of that guy? I got in my car and drove down the road and I'm just, just fuming. And I realized it took nerve to tell me the truth. He was right. I have to help. Because God has told me what God is up to. I have to help because Jesus has told me everything the Father has said. He chose me. I didn't choose him. He put me in the world to bear fruit that won't spoil. I have to help because Jesus has called me friend. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Join me now as we affirm our faith in a God who calls us friends. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, God has entrusted us with everything that belongs to God. And God calls upon us to be good stewards, to give to the needs of the world. And so as you fulfill God's call on your life to be a good steward. You can send in your gifts, your tithes, and your offerings to the addresses you see appearing on the screen. And you can trust and know that God will bless and multiply those gifts and use them for God's kingdom work of loving other people, meeting their needs in this community and around the world because of your giving. Join me as we pray together over these gifts. Loving God, help us through our giving, our living, and our loving to live up to the challenge of loving you as you have loved us. In the name of Christ, we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Go now as friends of Jesus, bear good fruit, Love others as Christ has loved you. Amen. Have a great week.